All right, um, I'm gonna get us started right now. Uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome Holly for her second Steenbach lecture, um, which is gonna be on hormone responsive brain module power movement and skeletal strength. Um, and so I'm gonna steal this. Um, these events are made possible from the generous donations to the Harry Steenbach Lectureship Fund. Um, and these are some photos of Harry Steenbach in uh, his younger years uh, when he grew up on a 120 acre farm here in Wisconsin. Um, he later went on to be a prolific scientific researcher. He published over 250 papers through his academic career. Um, and he made some fundamental discoveries. And some of those included discoveries in vitamin D and vitamin A. Uh, and from the patents of those, he was able to start the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. Um, and but I think what really makes Harry Steenbach stand out is his vision for the future of science. Um, Worf was one of the first, uh, kind of one of the first patent institutes at any university. Um, and then also he trained over 135 different graduate students throughout his time. Um, and so to celebrate his prolific career, we have started this lectureship and I have invited Holly as part of this. Um, Holly is a phenomenal researcher who has a really diverse array of scientific stories. Uh, yesterday we heard a lot about lipids in the intestine and how, uh, and also the liver and also the brain. I did not anticipate we'd be talking about rectal balloons, but there we were at the end of the talk. Um, but today she's gonna share a slightly different story. Um, and I hope you guys have realized she has made a phenomenal contribution to science, not just through the trainees and her scientific research, but also the programs that she started and headed, which have been recognized both um, at UCSF and also nationally. So without further ado, thank you so much, Holly. All right, well, uh, okay. This is uh, less crowded than it was yesterday, but I actually think that this story is uh, really quite, the, this area of research I'm very excited about doing. Um, so um, I'm gonna talk to you today about hormones and nerves and female physiology, and it sort of um, extends what I've been talking about uh, or where we're going in terms of the gut. But today, what I'm going to talk about is the brain. And um, so why did I start doing this? Uh, so I started this project um, in part because the nuclear receptors that I talked about, one of them is highly enriched in the ventral medial hypothalamus. Um, but I also, as I got more and more into this, I began understanding that this was a region that expresses, um, uh, is very important for estrogen signaling. And then as I thought more about it, especially as an aging woman, I decided that it was quite, that what we don't know in uh, female physiology is what estrogen is really doing in the brain to give, to give us a metabolic benefit. Uh, and a benefit in, in many, many ways in terms of our bone, cognition, et cetera. And I think that this hasn't been important, but it will become more and more important. And because I put together this chart showing that um, really uh, back, you know, in 1700, this really wasn't an issue because very few women were going to be in estrogen depletion. Uh, because they would be dead. Um, and, but as we've, as things, antibiotics and, and other things have come about, we now, um, the, a significant population of the women in this country and other industrialized countries are gonna be alive for at least four decades, three to four decades in an estrogen depleted state. And the issue is, do you take, you know, hormone replacement therapy and there's controversy surrounding that because of breast cancer. But um, so you have women that have naturally gone through menopause that are under, that will be estrogen depleted. But you also have 3 billion breast cancer survivors that 
are going to be on aromatase inhibitors to eliminate estrogen for five to 10 years of their life and essentially send them into premature menopause. So I felt that um, we needed to understand, uh, because I'm a very mechanistic person, I thought, okay, I'm going to start understanding this at a mechanistic level to really understand how estrogen um, in the brain uh, is important for counteracting um, diseases of aging. And the goal really is to understand and define these estrogen-regulated neural pathways so that we could perhaps exploit them. And um, I, I just show this um, for those, because I was uh, in Rome, I saw this uh, bust of only, there's only three women, real women, but that are busts, wait, I'm saying that wrong. In, there's three busts of real women in Rome, and she is one of them, and so I always ask the trainees or somebody to guess who she is, because the amazing thing is she lived till she was 86 years old. And so she was not only physiologically fit, but she was also smart to not get killed off by her brothers and parents. Or I mean, they always killed each other off. And they, but she's, uh, so we can talk about that afterwards, after wine. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today are three, uh, an area of the brain called the medial basal hypothalamus, and it's just shown here in pink. And of course, we, for people that think about estrogen signaling, there's three major estrogen receptors, ER alpha, ER beta, both of those are nuclear receptors like I talked about yesterday. And then there's a uh, seven transmembrane G per estrogen receptor. So in this part of the brain, the only receptor that really does anything is ER alpha, which makes it simpler. And so I'm just going to show you here uh, aminofluorescence of uh, this part of the brain, a coronal section shown here, uh, shown with the um, ventral medial hypothalamus, this ventral lateral region, and then the arcuate nucleus. And the arcuate nucleus, if you've thought about satiety, this is where leptin is thought to act in terms of feeding behavior. Um, so what you see are these two regions that are highly enriched in estrogen signaling, but um, you also see this in males. So part of what I'm going to tell you about are endpoints that are definitely sexually dimorphic, but it's really not just because of the presence or absence of estrogen receptor alpha. So, um, okay, so what we... Um, have known, and this is work that um, our lab contributed as well as uh, Joel Elmquist and um, Zhu uh, has made a really important contribution with Deborah Clegg um, and others in rats, showing that in fact, if you just sort of think about these two regions, the arcuate nucleus was su uh, suggested to regulate food intake, so estrogen is gonna suppress food intake. And the VMHVL, is going to, um, but we actually are going to show that it's not involved in food intake. And then um, the VMHVL region is involved in energy expenditure, such as locomotion and bat thermogenesis. So uh, basically brown adipose tissue thermogenesis. Okay, so the team that did this work um, were Stephanie Correa, who's now an assistant professor at UCLA, Bill Krauss, who um, really was the pioneer on this second story that I'm going to tell you about, um, Candace, who just received a KO1, um, and then Ruben Rodriguez, who just recently joined, who's an Arachta scholar. And this was the team that did these two stories that I are really excited to present here. So um, what I'm going to tell you is that estrogen engages two nodes, two independent nodes, to essentially allocate the way energy is, uh, the way you allocate energy in females. And one is this sort of surprising finding that estrogen in the brain is important for this neuroskeletal node, and it basically decreases bone remodeling 
And the other story is that estrogen is very important for this spontaneous activity mode, sort of like instead of a trainer coming to you and telling you you have to do exercise, it's like, I want to get up and move. So that's really different. To, this is an, a spontaneous activity uh, known. Okay, so there's these two, uh, two stories I'm going to tell you about. But what I want to first tell you is that within this brain region, the effects of estrogen on the neuronal activity is, is quite different in these two regions. And I think this is where, when we think about hormone signaling, we really have to think about what they're doing in each cell type because it's, it's not always the same. So if we go in and we stage an animal, uh, a female, in estrus, which is low estrogen, you can see um, this is ER alpha, and what we've done here is we stain with uh, phospho S6, which is really a surrogate or a marker linked to the mTOR pathway that uh, is basically a surrogate for neuronal activity. And so everything is quiescent, nothing is really going on. And now if we then take an animal in proestrus, where it's high estrogen, all of a sudden you see this phospho S6 light up in the VMHVL. So you can do this, you can play the trick of taking the ovaries out and then giving super physiological doses of estrogen, but here we're just taking an animal in its normal estrus cycle and seeing this effect. And what um, I want to note is that in the arcuate nucleus where we have plenty of ER alpha, you don't see this neuronal activation. So right away we have this large difference in these two regions of the medial basal hypothalamus. So um, what we've done is we've taken two approaches to look at this problem. Um, we've used genetic tools like a genetic Cree. Um, here we used NKX 2.1 Cree, which, which comes on early in development, and essentially we've eliminated all ER alpha in this area of the brain. And I would say that other models that have used these different Crees um, really don't, they have not achieved a full knockout. And do, to be perfectly honest though, anybody who uses a Cree knows that they're not as specific as they say they are, and they're hitting other tissues. So um, we're always faced with this, especially if you work in the brain, and therefore we have um, other methods, stereotaxic viral Cree injections, to go in specifically to a geographical area and knock out the gene that you want to knock out. And so the beauty of this is that you know if you do this, it's from the brain, it's not from a peripheral tissue. And the other thing is that you can do this at different stages and different times. So you can do this in adult mice. So you're not dealing with some of the developmental aspects of knockouts. So in fact, this is what we did. Um, we went in and knocked out um, the estrogen receptor alpha in the VMHVL in the arcuate, as shown here. And what we see, um, if you knock out estrogen receptor alpha in the VMHVL, you see this loss of ambulatory activity during the dark phase and not in the, when you do the arcuate. Uh, in contrast, when you knock out uh, ER alpha in the arcuate, um, what you see is an increase in lean mass, as shown here. But we actually saw nothing else. We saw no change in food intake, no ch change in activity, only a change in lean mass. <clears throat> so we thought about that for a minute, and we did more experiments. And we looked at our genetic knockout, our NKX 2.1, and we see the same increase in lean mass. <clears throat> and this is... Um, I mean, so we had to sort of deal with this. Why is there an increase in lean mass? And um, so we, Stephanie, who, who uh, was about ready to leave the lab, was doing these uh, analyses. And she tells me that she knew right away that she wanted to use DEXA to look at these mice. 
The people in the lab tell me, no, the echo MRI machine was broken and she had to use the DEXA. So the echo MRI, for those of you who don't know the difference, is that it's much simpler, it's much faster, you don't have to put the animals to sleep. But the one thing that you're missing in an echo MRI that you're not getting with a DEXA is a bone mass. And um, I was just giving a talk in Las Vegas, so I put this in because, in fact, it was having to use the DEXA that really revealed this phenotype. So Stephanie came to me with these data. Uh, she was leaving the next week for UCLA, and uh, she showed me this four-star difference. And I loved it because you see it in females, but you don't in males. And um, I thought, wow, this is, this is a four-star difference. You just can't ignore that. And, um, but I don't know much about bone, and I'm not sure that this is, it, it's, a, it's significant statistically, but is it really significant? So um, I thought about this and thought about, oh, gee, do I really want to do anything in bone? And so I uh, reached out to some of the experts at UCSF, and we did what you're supposed to do, which is to do a three-dimensional micro CT to look at the distal femur. Um, are the L5, as, sh as shown here. And the re reason that you do this is because this is trabecular bone. Um, both of these sites are where you have trabecular bone, and this is bone that's going to degrade with osteoporosis. So all of the bone people really look at, at the distal femur or L5 to look at trabecular bone. And this is what bone looks like in a, in a normal wild type mouse. And surprisingly, at about 12 weeks, you're almost seeing peak bone mass. So in a mouse, it, I mean, it really uh, it starts disintegrating after that. Okay, this is what our mutant looked like. Um, so we have this amazing bone density is shown here, both in the L5 and the femoral, uh, the distal femur. And um, all I know is that this was significant because I got a call from the bone people, uh, Bob Nissenson, saying, what did you do? We want to know. We don't, we rarely, rarely see bone like this. The only bone phenotype that looks close to this is a sclerostin knockout which is now being used in the clinics. Anti-sclerostin antibodies uh, are being used for severe osteoporosis in older women and men. So um, this was highly significant. And more importantly, um, during aging, you can see that this bone phenotype persists quite nicely. So um, we, uh, let's see, OK. So th this was great, but of course, we needed to know more about it. Um, and this is just to say that, again, because that other model was using the NKX 2.1 Cree, we don't know if it's coming from the periphery or not. We went back in with stereotaxic uh, techniques to, to knock out ER alpha in these two regions to find out where it was being mediated from. And it's from the arcuate nucleus. So not the VMHVL, but from the arcuate nucleus. Okay. So um, we then spent about another year because within the arcuate nucleus, there are five major neuronal subtypes, all of them which express ER alpha. And we had to figure out who, which neuronal subtype was mediating this phenotype. And we thought at first it had to be dopaminergic neurons. We did profiling and we saw uh, changes in uh, KISS neurons, in dopaminergic neurons, in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase neurons, um, as, well, as well as two other subtypes. So we went through and got all the Crees to redo the experiment to figure out what neuronal subtype might be mediating this phenotype. And um, I was in Thailand when I got these data from Candace showing that in fact it's the KISS, when we use a KISS Cree that was recreated by Paul Miter and Steiner, to a very specific Cree that was really qu quite good, um, we can really see this bone phenotype. And, and this even exceeds the bone phenotype we saw 
before. Um, in fact, you can see it with the naked eye, so you don't even have to genotype these mice. You can see, or you don't have to put them through a micro CT. You can see this by a naked eye. And so much so that um, I, I forgot to mention that in our other model, as well as this model, we do not see this phenotype in males. So this is a very female-specific phenotype. And in looking at this phenotype a little bit, the, the kiss cree model, um, we can see that we start getting bone marrow, marrow failure. The spleen starts enlarging, so we see extramedullary hematopoiesis, which is what you might expect when you have this very dense bone and, and very little bone marrow. Okay, so... Um, we, there, we've published this, and there's a lot that you, if you're interested in the aspects of the bone and the bone phenotype, uh, the different um, aspects of that the bone people like to think about, which is bone formation, um, what it looks like is this is causing new bone formation rather than causing uh, incre a, a decrease of bone loss. <clears throat> so. As a person that thinks about hormones and endocrinology, the, one of the first things I wanted to know is, is this mediated by a neuronal circuit or is this mediated by a hormone? So a circulatory factor. So we did two experiments and one is, I, I'm sorry, this might look gross to some people, but essentially what you do is you take a two week old wild type female femur and you plant it in the backs of your mutant animal or your wild type, and you look to see uh, what happens to this bone. And this is really just taking a page from people that do this on a kidney capsule. They take these small bones and they put them on the kidney capsule and, and look at bone. So if you do this, um, the scheme is just shown here, and you take a wild type bone, put it onto a wild type uh, mouse, you, you see a normal looking bone. But as soon as you take the wild type bone, put it into a mutant mouse, all of a sudden you get this very nice increase in bone density and bone volume. So that was one experiment. And then we did a second experiment um, that I actually, as a person that thinks about endocrinology, I've always wanted to do, which is a parabiosis experiment. So this is where you're fusing um, mice together, and it's not that complicated. It sounds really complicated, but you're really, uh, you, you sew their, their legs, muscles together, and then pretty soon their circulation fuses. And this, of course, is the way Coleman and his uh, founder helped uh, Jeff Friedman identify leptin. So it was this classic parabiosis experiment. So we, we did this, and we sewed them together, and then did a baseline scan at, at week zero, and then at week three, up to week, uh, week nine. And um, parabiosis itself is hard on these animals and hard on their bones, and in fact, um, what happens over time is that you start losing bone in the wild type fused to a wild type, as shown here. But when you do this with a wild type fused to a mutant, you start seeing this buildup of bone mass. So we know that we have a circulatory factor, um, and we are um, now I think this is pretty, we don't know whether, where it's coming from. We know that manipulation of these neurons causes this circulatory factor, whether it's coming directly from the brain or the brain is signaling a signal to another organ uh, remains to be determined. Um, and so we are, we are developing a, an assay to actually look at that now and um, doing some biochemistry. So we also wanted to know what's going on in these bones a, li a little bit more closely, and we fiddled around with looking at some of the niches in bone. Um, it turns out that there's a lot of different ways to do that, and so we um, started working with Chuck Chan and Tam Tom Ambrosi, um, in part because 
Chuck with Longacre had to find a new skeletal stem cell population that essentially takes, uh, takes the skeletal stem cell and it can foam cartilage or bone. So we wanted to, we, after fiddling around with asking if uh, the uh, other cell types might change uh, and getting nowhere, we, we turned to them and said, maybe these skeletal stem cells are different in this massive bone. And I should say, this bone is not only dense, it's also very strong. So if you take a machine and you try to crush the L5, which is what they do to measure strength, um, the engineer, the bioengineer that did it for us said that basically the bone almost broke the parameters of the machine, that they would have to change them because it was so dense and so strong. So we have dense, strong bones, and we need to know why. Um, so with Tom and Chuck, we looked at these different um, niches, uh, including the mesenchymal stem cell, adipocyte progenitor cells, as well as these skeletal stem cells. And you can see quite nicely that we, we don't have changes. We have actually a drop in the bone adipocytes, which are bone fat, which is, you know, from a metabolism point of view, bone fat is quite fascinating. Um, you can come talk to me later. It's this really underexplored area. Um, but you have this very prominent increase in these skeletal stem cells. Okay, and not in males. So we then did two more things with Tom and Chuck, um, which are really cool experiments, which is you take these skeletal stem cells and you put them into culture, different media that's going to allow you to go towards bone or mineralization and cartilage as, as uh, detected by these two stains. And you can see that if you put the same amount of skeletal stem cells from the mutant and the wild type, you actually see more bone and more cartilage. And um, if you do another experiment that I think is just a beautiful experiment that they did for us, which is you take a package of these skeletal stem cells and you take wild type or mutant, you put them on a kidney capsule and transplant them, and then six weeks later you look to see what it's differentiated into. And so you can look at, you can stain with this pentachrome stain for cartilage. Uh, the mesenchymal area, the stromal area, and bone, and you can see in our mutant that we have much more bone and cartilage than the wild type. So not only do we have more cells, but these cells are really programmed to go into bone and cartilage. Um, so we've done single cell seek, um, and I will just say that of these skeletal stem cells, and we see with our mutant skeletal stem cells, we see an, an enrichment in this cluster. And now, of course, we're taking that genomic information um, and we're trying to figure out if we've got a surface plasma, a surface receptor that might be the target for this osteogenic program. So we, we still don't know uh, how we get so much bone formation. It's not through some of the classic uh, programs, and uh, obviously we hope that this uh, information, molecular information, is going to give us a clue along with our biochemistry. Okay, so what I, no, let's see, I'm going backwards. Okay, so what I've told you about in terms of the arcuate nucleus is there's a subset of neurons in the arcuate nucleus where ER alpha signaling, estrogen signaling, is essentially restraining bone growth in, in females. And it's really opposing the action of peripheral estrogen, which is going to be promoting, preventing the loss of bone. And in mice, it's an anabolic factor for bone. Um, and then when you knock this whole system out, you get this remarkable increase in bone and increase in these skeletal stem cells. And um, our, our question really now is what is, we're calling this brain-derived osteogenic factor, 
And we, of course, want to find out what it is. And I get an email every week from a woman, usually women who are suffering from premature, from osteoporosis, asking if we have found, can we, can we reproduce in humans what we have done in mice? So um, hopefully, we are, we are working very hard on this. OK, so um, and then you might ask yourself, why would you have this uh, signaling system? And we think that it comes on at different periods, life stages. Um, you might imagine that you want bone changing going into the fetus, for instance, the energy going into the fetus in late stage pregnancy when you do start losing bone. In the pre and post lactation period where you see really large bone changes in bone density in the pre and post pubertal growth period. So um, it, it's a counter, it's a really for a very counterintuitive finding, but one that we think is actually going to be important physiologically at different life stages. Okay, so um, that is sort of this neuroskeletal node. And now I'm going to tell you about this new activity node that um, we just uh, uploaded to BioArchives. It's in review, and I'm hoping that the reviewers like it. Um, I think this story is, is pretty cool. So um, back in 1924, uh, Slonocker, um did lots of experiments on rats where he just looked at giving them different chow, giving them, I mean, he did everything you could think about. And in 1924, you can imagine the tools for looking at these rats was, was fairly crude. But what he developed was a system to look at their activity over time. So no clams, no TSE chambers, no any, uh, <laughs> no, none of the, the techniques that we use today. Um, and it was actually pretty ingenious, and if you want to read this, it's, it's really fun to read. And what he noted um, is that there has to be this intrinsic rhythmic change in, in animals, in females, because what he would see is that every four days, you would have this spike in activity and a reduction of food intake. So every four days in a young adult, this is what the activity looks like. And then as the rat ages, you can see that this, these activity spikes go down. So we now know that of, uh, in, in part because of Wisconsin farmers, <laughs> the dairy, dairy farmers now really use this, what's known in, in a lot of agricultural, in an agricultural setting, is that there is this activity spike that correlates with ovulation. And so they not only use these Fitbits for cows to look at their health, but they use them to figure out when they're going into heat. And, and that's because, you know, as, as I read someplace, the mounting activity is a 5.8 hours. So if you have a big herd, I don't, I don't know if that's what you call these cows, dairy cows, uh, you have limited time to make it happen, either with artificial insemination or so. In fact, there, it was on 60 Minutes. I urge you all to look at Wisconsin. They did a whole thing on Wisconsin dairy farms on 60 Minutes about Fitbits and cows. So, um, and you can just see here, this is sort of what that activity spike, spike looks like um, in terms of every 21 days is when they ovulate. So, um, this has been known for a long time, and it's being exploited now in terms of these uh, Fitbits. And yet, we don't, we don't really know why you get this surge of activity right before ovulation. Um, and so, um, we, um, but we know that if you get rid of ER-alpha and the VMHVL, as I showed you earlier, you get this lowered activity in, during the dark cycle. So um, Bill Krauss started working on this problem, and one of the first things we did was to profile the, the, that microdissected VMHVL 
in an OVX female where we're giving them back estrogen. And we just are saying, what are the estrogen responsive genes in this area? And um, the one gene that we focused in on was melanocortin-4 receptor. Um, and we verified that, yes, during estrus, it's low. During proestrus, it goes up. And in males, it's, it's quite low. Um, and then we did in situ hybridization in this uh, region, showing that it, this is true. It, you can see this beautiful staining that occurs in the VMHVL during proestrus, and it's off in males. And um, I should say that melanocortin-4 is not a, a new gene for anybody who thinks about obesity. It is one of the most common form of monogenic obesity out there in the human population. So, but people uh, really have not looked at it in this region, in part because if you go on to Alan's Brain Atlas, this is what you'll look at, because most people are looking at males. So, um, uh, th this is what I've just said, that um, melanocortin-4 is, you know, leptin, there's 12 individuals with a leptin mutation. This is not true for melanocortin-4. There's a lot of individuals with uh, a partial loss of function or loss of function. And now they've actually found gain of function so that the melanocortin-4 doesn't recycle into the cell but stays out on the membrane. And those people are protected and are lean. So it's, it's, really, it's clear that it's linked to obesity because of hyperphagia or overeating. And this is just a young child with one of these mutations. But um, what they know from both human genetics and from um, the mouse genetics uh, where they went and knocked out melanocortin-4 is that there's a sex difference. So humans, um, females, women with melanocortin-4 defects really seem to suffer from more diabetes um, as well as other, uh, you know, all the other uh, dis symptoms that go along with this um, mutation. And what uh, Paul Miter and another group showed um, very early on is that if you take a male mouse, a mutant male mouse, and you pair feed them, so let's, um, okay. So if you pair feed a male mouse, a mutant male mouse, you can get it back to normal. But you can't really do that with a, a female mutant. So you can see here, it, it's improved, but not totally improved. So there's this female-male difference that was noted very early on. I mean, this paper was from 2000, but nobody had really uh, pursued that. OK, so um, uh, Bill and Andreas Rodriguez looked uh, a little bit more closely at the hot spots of melanocortin-4 receptor expression. And um, what uh, these are just the different regions where we have expression. This is the VMHVL region where we have ER alpha. The PVH is the region that, that really regulates satiety and you don't see any overlap. And this is the medial amygdala where there is some overlap. And if you look at it a bit more closely, the only important aspect of this slide is that in the VMHVL, every neuron that expresses ER alpha expresses melanocortin-4. So there's a complete concordance of expression of these two signaling um, molecules. And that's not true in other regions of the brain. Um, and this just shows that it, the, the VMHVL neurons are highly sensitive to estrogen with respect to melanocortin-4, but not in other regions of the brain. OK, um, we have this nice thing where we show that, um, that melanocortin-4 is an estrogen responsive gene. And that's always nice if you're thinking about correlations. But um, as mechanistic as I am, I wanted to know whether estrogen receptor alpha can be recruited to the melanocortin-4 promoter. And that's not so simple to do, especially in cell lines. I, I was not really happy w with doing that. So we reached out, um, and Jessica Tolkien, who has spent about a year and a half working out cut and run 
with the subcortical neurons to actually figure out what are all the estrogen responsive genes and figuring out where estrogen receptor alpha is recruited in a ligand dependent way. And she called me up right as we were ready to get this paper uploaded and she said, I found it. We, we have the peak, uh, the, the estradiol benzoate peak with uh, ER alpha being recruited right to the proximal promoter of the melanocortin 4 uh, promoter and with some of our other targets. So this is wonderful. We no longer need to hand wave. ER alpha is regulating melanocortin 4. Um, <clears throat> And this is just what it looks like. This, there's a half ERE along with an SP1 motif, which is also found in the progesterone receptor. So that's, that's sort of interesting for those of you who think about this. Um, so we then use three methods to sort of get at the connection of melanocortin-4 signaling and estrogen with our physiological endpoint, our activity. So we've done three things, and I'm going to go through this because I know that, that many of you are not neuroscientists. Um, we wanted to stimulate these neurons with dreads. So dreads, for those of you who don't know it, Brian Roth developed these. These are these designer receptors that are activated by a synthetic ligand. So you can basically put these in stereotactically, turn them on in a Cree-dependent way, give your synthetic ligand and activate these neurons, or you can inhibit neurons. Okay, so we did that in these, these neurons, and um, we also then restored melanocortin-4 to a null mouse that has no melanocortin-4 receptor in it. And then finally, we increased the dosage of melanocortin-4 via a CRISPR-A technology. So I'm gonna go through each one of these experiments. Um, Okay, so this is what I thought, you know, a movie's worth a lot. So here we're activating these neurons with these dreads, giving C and O. And you can see an hour later, after we've given a single injection of C and O, the mice on the right look like all of us want to be active all the time. <laughs> uh, although not. You, I guess you wouldn't want to be active all the time. But even five hours later, you can see this is when we begin the experiment, uh, an hour later, this movie of course is sped up, and then uh, five hours later, these mice are still moving around. Okay, so this is really powerful to activate these neurons. Um, we see uh, activity in males, okay? So we're, we're sort of bypassing estrogen and we can see activity in, in males as well. And the, the data are just shown here. Um, if we chronically stimulate these neurons, so there we're just stimu we're giving one bolus of CNO and then we're looking five hours, and that lasts for about five hours. Here, what we're doing is we're chronically stimulating those neurons by adding CNO to the water. And you can see we have this drop in weight that, that, that persists. It's about a 15% or 12% drop in the weight. And then as soon as we get rid of CNO, we normalize. Now, we've also looked at um, bat thermogenesis, and we don't see any changes. Um, so we think that th these sets of neurons are clearly distinguished from those that are going to contribute to bat thermogenesis. Uh, OK, so we then restored central melanocorn 4 receptor only in the VMH and look to see if we could get an effect. So remember, these mice are overeating uh, by a lot. Let me just show you. Their food intake is enormous. And you can see here's a null mouse. I mean, that body weight difference is quite large. But we can drop it by about 10 to 12% just by restoring melanocortin-4 only to the VMHVL. So these neurons. They're not going to offset this hyperphagia, but they are going to have an effect on the overall uh, endpoint, physiological endpoint. And we do not see any effect in males when we do this. OK. Um, we think this, of course, is activity because we can see this spike up in activity. Um, 
But we did a lot of this in clams, and as I was telling some people earlier today, I'm really, I'm it's not really happy with clams data. It's somewhat all over the place. And we were thinking, what else do we have to do to really think about this story and link melanocorn for signaling to activity? Because I think that's what you want to be able to do. Take a gene and link it to activity. And you can't do that by just activating the neurons. That's, that doesn't work, even with optogenetics or dread chemogenetics like we've used. You, ha you need something else. So um, we turned uh, our attention to using a CRISPR-A technology. And the idea would be that if um, we could increase the dosage in a wild-type mice in this VMHVL region, would we see a change in activity? And so we were extremely fortunate that Navanit uh, and Nadav had really gone through all the promoter of the melanocortin-4 to figure out what the best guide RNA is in terms of activation. So um, I heard him talk at a retreat about this and said, OK, I want to use this in, in our setting. And um, OK, so if we um, essentially, if you, what we do, it's a dual virus system. So one virus uh, carries the guide RNA with an m cherry reporter. The other carries the Cas9 VP64. VP64 is simply uh, VP16 times 4. It's an activation domain. And um, what we didn't know is that before we even started this experiment, but just turned out to be the case, is that the guide RNA sits right on top of that ERE. So we really are bypassing any estrogen receptor alpha recruitment and, and the need for estrogen. So, OK, so we target. We know how to hit the VMHVL. Great. Um, what happens? So I should say that this is one of those times when you do an experiment and you're waiting, we're expecting to see weight loss. And so we, you know, two months go on, two and a half months go on, and we are seeing no weight loss. And um, so I, you know, I just thought this had to work. So I said to Bill, let's take these mice and put them into uh, an any maze system and look at their activity. And when you do that, you can see this is four months after we've injected the CRISPR-A. You can see this. Um, and, and we tried to do this by clams, and the data were all over the place. So we, we turned it the, the any maze, which is just a wonderful system for looking at locomotion and activity. You can see that you have this activity in the dark time, so we haven't disrupted their diurnal rhythms, um, that essentially if you walk 10,000 steps, you'd be walking 20,000 steps a day. So um, this, is, uh, just, this is just the total distance traveled, and some of these mice really travel a lot during the dark period. Um, and we see this in males as well. It's not quite as robust, but we can see this in males, which was what we would expect because we bypassed estrogen uh, in terms of where we targeted. So we have these mice moving twice as much. Um, and because of that, their bone actually gets denser. And we, we measured that because, remember, mechanical loading, everybody says if you want to preserve your bone, go out and run and walk. OK, go out and run and walk, because <laughs> these bones are, are denser. Um, but in fact, when you look at this, uh, one of the perplexing things that we still are, don't quite understand is that the body weight ad lib is not changed, and it's only when we pair feed them that we start dropping their body weight. They're moving twice as much, and this is just continuous. And their food intake, uh, this is a bit perplexed. I mean, their food intake is not that different 
Um, it's not statistically different. So why is it that you pair feed? Then it's, you see this drop in body weight. And it does remind me that, in fact, if you just exercise without changing diet, it's really hard to lose weight. I mean, the, all the human studies support that. And this Ohio teen, you know, he walked to school every day, rain or shine or snow, but he also had to change his eating patterns and he had to restrict his eating. So um, we uh, tell people what we'd like to think of is, um, uh, if you think about this system now, we have these neurons and there's only about 200 neurons in the brain of a mouse that have this melanocortin-4 and estrogen alpha in the VMHVL. And essentially, um, Estrogen c comes on board, gets, increases the transcription of melanocortin-4, and that you have this integration of this system of the melanocortin signal and estrogen signal to then cause your mouse to run, female mice to run around more. Um, and uh, what, of course, we'd like to do now with this system is ask, can we, is this operational in a very old female or male mouse? Can we see this? Um, and at, can we, we, we're not losing weight without pair feeding them, but exercise does much more than that. Rather, it just, it's not just about your weight, it's about your whole health. And one of the things that um, it, we think is going to be quite informative is to look at this model and Alzheimer's disease model as well as a stroke model because those are two things that have exercises been uh, reported to offset these these diseases so um, and then we really want to know how long this effect will last we we sacrificed the mice at four months and they were still moving around but it, how long will it last and I mean I guess Nadav has a patent to actually fix haploinsufficient diseases with this CRISPR-A technology. And so you could think 10 years in the future that maybe you could go in and manipulate neurons for, you know, I mean, this is all sci-fi, but um, where you, rather than doing gastric bypass, which is really major surgery, maybe manipulation of neurons is gonna get you where, where you wanna go. It's, it's something to think about, and I, I know the technology is gonna get better, and what's great about this is it's long-lasting. You're not putting in anything, you're just asking the gene to do its normal thing. So, um, and then we wanna know very much, it's there in males, what's triggering this in males? Is it triggered in that postnatal, surge of estrogen that they see in males um, before you get the male masculinization. So we don't know that yet. And then this is just to show you that in fact, if you give estrogen to males, you can see melanocortin-4 coming on. So the system's there, it's just when is this engaged. Okay, um, and then if you wanna look at this, we've uploaded this to bioarchives. Um, so we think that this activity node that was seen almost 100 years ago, that these neurons really are the main focal point for, for this activation in females. And of course, there's many, you know, many other aspects that you require this activity node you know, there's a lot of other things that need to go on for mating. And so all of these behaviors need to be coordinated in order to, uh, in order to mate. And if you think about this part of the brain, you know, there's only two things you want to do, really, as, a, as an animal. You want to preserve fuel or intake fuel, and you want to reproduce. And so... This, this is a node that we think is absolutely essential for reproduction. Um, and it is, we found th just this in June um, 2019, uh, melanocortin agonists are one of the first, maybe the second drug approved for premenopausal women for um, libido, or hyposexual dysfunction. Um, and so 
it's only in premenopausal women, and perhaps it is working through this circuit to then increase melanocortin-4 and increase overall activity. So we don't know, and I'm not going to speculate in any questions <laughs> about this. So what I've told you about are these two nodes. One is to increase energy expenditure. Uh, involved in mate seeking, maternal behavior, exercise. And then um, the other node, of course, is to regulate the allocation into bone, because ener putting energy in bone is energetically costly. Um, so th we, we think just continuing to do this and understand what estrogen is doing in the different regions of the brain is really going to be very fruitful in terms of normal female physiology, but also in disease states, such as Alzheimer's disease, which shows this strong sex bias, as well as other psychiatric diseases. Um, so uh, with that, the, the people that did this work are Candace and Bill, helped by Stephanie uh, and, uh, and others. Um, we were helped again by a whole slew of collaborators. And um, this is the bridge we go across. And then what I want to say for anybody, it's not as crowded as it was yesterday, but um, we just received two, what are the odds? This year we got two grants that received two percentile scores. And so I am um, looking for postdocs because <laughs> I need to. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I will open it to the floor for questions, and James will start us off. Thank you very much for that exciting talk. So I did notice that uh, in the Mariano uh, Cortico 4 uh, knockdown, right, uh, there was increased food intake. In what? In the, the, in, in, uh, in the receptor knockout. The, the, uh, the, the MCR4. Ah, okay. So, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. MCR. Yeah. No, I mean, you mean if we just, uh, in the, if you knock out melanocortin 4 globally, right. you see this profound change in food intake, right? So you see increased food intake right. in uh, really profound hyperphagia uh, when you knock out the receptor. Right. Um, and I think the, the puzzle has been, for males, all you need to do is restrict their food and you'll normalize their weight. But that has not been true for females. Even though you're, you're, you're normalized, you're increasing their hyperphagia, you, when you pair feed them, you can't get them to where the wild types are. I see. So, I, I so there's these other parameters, these other metabolic parameters that have been out there. And, and it's probably true. It's probably not just food intake that melanocortin-4 uh, affects. There's sort of emotional eating. For the human data, it, it says there's more than just food intake. There's a whole list of other things that comes with that mutation. I see. So I was just wondering what happens to the leptin signaling. Ah, to the leptin point. signaling. Uh, well, you know, we, ha we haven't looked at the le leptin signaling per se because there's not, um, I mean, that would be an interesting thing to look at. Um, we're not seeing this really huge change in body weight, so there's sort of no reason to think there would be a change in leptin signaling because leptin is primarily delivered to the brain from fat. Yeah, so good question, though. What about affect um, mania or depression? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the only thing I'll say is that we did some, um, we did marble bearing assays. We started to look at anxiety in part. And we, we really need to pursue this a little bit more because when we activate those neurons, the mice run around like crazy, but they also go to the food hopper and they start 
gnawing at it, but they don't eat any more food. So they just get, they run around, but they almost get hyper-like um, and anxious. So as well as you can measure that in a mouse, so behave, anxiety in a mouse is not always so easy. I mean, we can do open field, and, but we want to pursue that a little bit more. That's a great question. And you know, I'm intrigued, it, as you said earlier, it's a little counterintuitive because estrogen seems to be doing the opposite in the brain. Yes. So is there, well, I mean, what if you do the really crude experiment of delivering estrogen to the brain? So that's a wonderful idea, and that's what I actually got funded to do, <laughs> is to not only uh, estrogen, but also what we want to do is give tamoxifen, because tamoxifen is bone sparing for those who have breast cancer. Um, and it's always been thought that it works as an agonist in bone, but it's an antagonist in the breast. And that's what makes it good. Uh, it's not as effective as an aromatase inhibitor. So we're wondering if the bone effect is actually mediated by the brain. So we are doing those experiments. And we're also giving a pure ER alpha antagonist um, to, to see what we can see. And tamoxifen crosses those blood brain barriers? So tamoxifen does, the pure ER alpha antagonist doesn't. So we're, we're going to go in right to the arcuate. Um, and the, the other thing, cool thing we're doing is we're taking those skeletal stem cells and we're going to deliver right into the arcuate nucleus and look to see if we build bone right, right in the brain. <laughs> a new kind of pyrobiosis. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm not exactly familiar with how a high fat diet is controlled for carbs, but I had known there were some carbohydrate genotype by environment effects with MC4R in humans. Did you try to vary the carbohydrates? No, we did not. Uh, we, we haven't done, we just, we haven't done anything with a high fat diet. Um, we just wanted to look on chow and, uh, but that, one of the things that we do want to do with the CRISPR-A females is to challenge them with a high fat diet. And I take your suggestion, we should use, you know, put in high carbohydrates. Those are amazingly dense bones. How do the animals react to that? Do they have, are they less active? Uh, no, and they, we did grip strength and they, they're fine. Um, the one thing that we'd like to do is look at the calcification of their vasculature because that's one of the things in osteoporosis, you get calcification in your, in your vascular system. So we probably should look at that. Um, they seem to be fine. I mean, they're, they're doing fine. <laughs> All right, I will ask the last question. Um, so in terms of, I guess, so <clears throat> one of the major things you saw was a decrease in the marrow adipose tissue um, depot. And I am curious if, yeah. are the, is it known that there are differences between males and females in marrow adipose tissue and? Yeah, I don't, I, not that I know of. I, the, uh, Tom Ambrosi in Chuck's lab is, is really starting to look at that. Um, the, the weird thing about bone fat is that uh, it's really high in anorexia, it's really high in starvation, it's really high in obesity, and it's really high in type 2 diabetes. So essentially, as soon as you have fatty bone, you're unhealthy. So it's really an indication of your overall metabolic health. And what is, you know, rather than saying it's being lean or obese, it's about your metabolic health. So I think in that sense, it's a very cool fat depot that is poorly understood. All right, um, please join me in thanking Holly one last time. <laughs>